I want to say welcome to everybody. I'm Jean Lippman Blumen, and I'm on the board of ILA. I've been blessed to be on the board for several years and to have the, com the colleagueship, the companionship, the love and support of that wonderful group of people. And um, I want to say thank you to all of you for coming here to celebrate Warren Bennis. He's somebody well worth celebrating, and I'll say a few words about that. <clears throat> I personally want to say a special thank you to the founding mothers and fathers of this organization, because I do believe that this organization has a certain kind of civility, that you don't find in other uh, um, professional organizations, an openness, a welcoming spirit, and an interest in conversation about big ideas without a need to compete for preeminence of ideas. So I particularly want to say thank you to Warren because I know you were one of the founding fathers and to Jim Burns and to Lorraine Matusek and Georgia Sorensen and Barbara Kellerman. And I, I wasn't there, so I don't know all the names, but thank you one and all. We are forever in your debt. And I particularly want to thank Cynthia Cherry today because she gave me the best job of all to introduce the introducer. So it's a very small little piece that I have to do here, and that's very nice. Um, and I myself came to the study of leadership very late in life in my, and late in my career. And I came to it late for two major reasons. One, because in case you can't tell where this accent is from, it's a Bostonian accent. And in Boston, leadership, particularly leadership, was not a very esteemed career or path to anything. In fact, some of you may know the way back, I, it was before I was born, James Michael Curley was elected either governor or mayor. You cannot find out on the web. It is so convoluted, his history, that is. But he was elected from a jail cell. So you sort of get the flavor. The Bostonian's idea of a leader is somebody who is sitting in a jail cell. And of course, he was there for good reason. He claimed that he had, um, he had taken, an, a, I think, a civil service exam for somebody else. And he was simply doing it as a favor. There was no corruption involved. And he, uh, he uh, led the city from that jail cell for six months before Harry Truman pardoned him. So, you know, you get a little flavor of the place. And then some years later, I recall, in another administration, um, the headline of the Boston Herald said that a bookie operation had been uncovered in the, May in the governor's private elevator. So once again, you see that this is an ongoing uh, theme in Boston leadership. But I can't blame it all on Boston. I have to blame some of it on my mother, who, uh, <laughs> who was very cynical about leadership her entire life, even to the year in which she died when she was 102. And she happened to be in the hospital for something very minor. And the chaplain came in to ask her if she wanted some, um, some religious counseling. And my mother said, no, thank you. But the, the, the chaplain kept insisting, and my mother kept resisting. And finally, the chaplain looked at the P on my mother's chart and thought maybe a J would be better. So she said, uh, well, maybe, Mrs. Lipman, you would prefer to have, uh, to speak to the rabbi. But I'm afraid she's away backpacking this weekend, so she won't be able to speak to you. Well, for my mother, born in 1900, those three words, she, rabbi, backpacking, 
did not fit, couldn't cram themselves into one sentence, no way. And so my mother sent her on, you know, very politely, but because she was a Bostonian, sent her on her way. And my husband was standing there, and he said to my mother, Mother, I don't understand. You're a very religious woman. Why didn't you want to speak to the rabbi? And she gave him, you know, the mother-in-law look. You all know that one. And, um, and she said, under her breath, she said, I don't need a rabbi. What I need is a boyfriend. <laughs> so you see, she not only remained cynical, but she, she kept her priorities straight right up to the end. But I must say that when I did come late to the field of leadership, I was really, um, I think, amazed and in wonderment at the work of Warren Bennis. Um, I think I stayed in the field of leadership and became more entranced, not only by Warren's writing, but also by Warren as a person and as a friend. So I feel a personal debt of gratitude to Warren to have been nourished by his ideas, by his brilliance, and by his generosity. And I will just tell you one tiny, if I can get through it without tearing up, tell you one personal story that has always endeared me to Warren. In, I think it was 90, 1993. You have to understand that my husband, Hal Levitt, and Warren went back 45, 55 years, a long time before I knew either one of them. And, um, and so I met Warren originally and Grace through Hal in 1991. And about a year later, Hal was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And that was a very difficult time in our lives. And there were people who called up and said, oh, well, uh, sorry to hear about it. Hope, if you need anything, let us know. But Warren stood out above all other people in that period in our lives because he called us every single day. And he called first to do something that I think so few people would do, to talk to Hal about what it meant to have that, the intimate details of it, to shore him up, to make him feel better, to call me and say, Gene, that's the wrong doctor. Here's the right doctor. I'll intervene. I'll get the appointment for you. And so for me, Warren has always had a very special, special place, not only in my heart, not just as somebody who's brilliant and articulate and funny, witty, good company, urbane, all kinds of things, but his human generosity at, at his own expense, because most people wouldn't, wouldn't really want to be as revealing in order to shore up somebody else's difficult period. So Warren, I never forgot that. And no matter, if, if there isn't anything you could ever do that would change that for me. So thank you, thank you so much. So I am here simply, as I said, to be the introducer of the introducer. And, the in and I would like to say, since Warren and the introducer both come from USC, from the Marshall School of Business, I would like to say a special thank you to the Marshall School on behalf of ILA for all your generosity to the ILA in so many ways and for uh, supporting Cynthia as well in, in her incarnation at USC. So you've, you've done something quite marvelous, and thank, we are, we're all in your debt. Um, and so now I will get to the point. Uh, I would like to introduce Arvind uh, Bombay, who uh, is a professor at the Department of Management and Organizational Behavior at the Marshall School of Business. And he is going to be the one who will introduce Warren and tell you all the wonderful things that I didn't have a chance to tell you. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'm really humbled and very privileged to be here to be nominating Warren. And, you know, I feel like a sandwich between two superstars. Uh, and, but I am very, very privileged to do this. Uh, the last time I talked to Warren, and I did not ask him today, he had written about 31 books. And it's something you have to keep up with because it changes every week. And in 2004 alone, I think he had four books. So I kind of calculated this going back to 1961 when he published his first book. And he has had a book about once every 17 months. Um, that's the average, but in the last decade, it has greatly picked up his productivity. Um, I first met Warren when I'd just come out of graduate school. Actually, I was still a graduate student. And I came to USC for an interview. And the interview had gone well, and I was all ready to leave when the department chair said, uh, oh, let me see if Warren Bennis is in his office and see if he has a minute to spare to see you. And I got really anxious. Uh, I, I started to quick and I said, I hope he's not in his office because he might, <laughs> because if he is, you know, he might have some penetrating question and my shallowness and ignorance is going to be revealed. Um, so when the chair came out and said, oh yes, oh he's, gonna, he's got a few minutes to see you, I quaked. Um, and then I saw this person getting up and walking towards me very dapper, very elegant, with his white hair, looking like he'd stepped straight out of the great Gatsby pages. Um, and, but just before he got to me, he smiled, and he stuck his hand out, and he said, Arvind, I've been looking forward to seeing you. Uh, I haven't met anyone from Calcutta in years. And immediately, I relaxed, uh, because immediately, you know, the message to me was, one, he knew something about me, and I knew I could talk about Calcutta, if nothing else. Um, <laughs> and a few minutes into that conversation, uh, I felt so good about myself that I could have spent the rest of the day with him. And Warren had the, has this rare quality. If you're having lunch with him, you kind of wish that the lunch would never end. When you meet him, he just has this way of making you feel good about yourself. And it's sort of like the quality of a healer. You meet him and you feel better. And it's this warmth and generosity that he brings, because when he's with you, you feel that you are all that matters to him. And what I've realized over the years, that that is in fact true. It's not an act. He really does care about you, and he at that moment is truly in the moment enjoying your company. Um, I, I took the job at USC, and I was living in Santa Monica, and Warren called me one day and said, you know, are you interested in playing racquetball? And so we, went out and we sort of both joined a sports club together. And for the next few years, every week, a couple of times a week, I'd drive over, I'd pick up Warren at six o'clock in the morning, we'd go play racquetball for an hour, and then we'd have breakfast together. And I realized very quickly what a rare gift I had received. Because here was someone who was an advisor to US presidents and Fortune company CEOs, and I just got to spend a couple of hours with him several days a week for several years. And it began a lifetime friendship and a mentorship and a relationship that is so near and dear and, and important that if I'd known this would happen, I would have come to USC even if they didn't pay me a salary. Uh, <laughs> Now, Warren, okay, if you look at what some people have said about him and his work, and I'm just going to read a couple of these comments. Um, Richard Parsons, CEO of Time Warner, 
This is an instant classic that will be read and consulted by leaders and those who seek to become leaders for years to come. George Shultz, former Secretary of State. Great calls deserve a comparable book to explain them, and now we have one. Read, learn, enjoy. Uh, let me uh, jump forward, okay. Uh, Rosabeth Cantor, only Warren Bennis could write a book on leadership that is so inspiring and insightful, captivating and wise, eloquent and re revealing. <clears throat> Tom Peters, I love this book. It reflects humanity, openness, courage, and rigorous thinking in equal measures. For those of you who wish to be inspired by the idea and practice of the curious life, richly spent, you'll know, do no better than to thoughtfully consider this book. Okay. So Warren has had a remarkable impact on the world of leadership and actually of every individual human being that he's come across. But to truly appreciate his achievements, you have to know a little bit more about his life. Because you look at him today and you look at this elegant figure and you kind of imagine that he was born into a rich family, you know, with estates. And instead, Warren was born in the Bronx in New York. Parents who were what you might generously call lower middle class. His father ran a series of malt shops and ice cream shops, worked 18 hours a day. And Warren often worked with him at the store. And as he recalls, there would be times when he would come home at night and they would have to brush off the ring of dirt around their ankles with a hard brush. And he remembers as one of his most hopeless moments when his father lost his job completely during the Depression. And he said that you know, he never wanted to ever have that feeling of hopelessness again. He was not a good student in school. And in fact, he, as he said, his father called him a mopey for someone who moped all the time. He had no hobbies, no interests, almost no friends. <laughs> he, uh, he did have, when he reached eighth grade though, there was a teacher that he liked, Miss Scherer, whose uh, brother, William Scherer, was reporting uh, news of the war at that time. And uh, this was in New Jersey. And one day, Ms. Scherer decided to give uh, an assignment to the class, and she asked all the, the students to come in and talk about their hobbies. Now, Warren panicked because he didn't have any. <laughs> uh, so he thought about what he could do, and he said the only thing that he actually did with some regularity was polish the family shoes. So he decided that he would go into class and talk about polishing shoes. And he went into class with a box of the different polishes and waxes and brushes. And he gave this speech about cordovan versus brown versus brushes versus uh, paint and waxes and oil. The boys in the class were stunned and didn't say anything. But Miss Scherer was so delighted with his imagination and presentation that she jumped up and clapped and he got a standing ovation. And in that moment, a new Warren Bennis was born. Okay. So, okay, as a shoe shine boy. <laughs> because what he realized at that point was the power of his imagination and how he could captivate an audience with his words. So we owe a debt of gratitude to the eighth grade teacher, Miss Scherer in New Jersey. Now, when he got out of school, he joined the army. He passed uh, what was an officer, special officer test, and joined the army. And in 1944, he became the youngest infantry commander 
in the European theater of operations. Okay. He was 19 years old okay, and had gone there. Uh, and he recalls how being in the army taught him self-discipline. It taught him how being efficiently organized and using your time wisely was so critical. And it taught him how to take care of people. Because if you didn't do that, people died. Okay. And he talks about his platoon mates as some of his earliest mentors. Okay. So when he was 20, he was in Frankfurt. At the age of 20, he was an officer, member of the officer's club, living in the Frankfurt apartment, had a jeep and a driver and seriously considered an army career. But fortunately, his runner, and in, in the World War, Second World War, people used to have runners to send messages for, between you know, uh, units and so on, because we didn't have walkie-talkies. His runner had attended Antioch, and he often talked about always wanting to go back to Antioch after the war. And this runner, had died on the last day of the war by stepping on a mine. So Warren thought he would go to Antioch. And he went to Antioch. And that was the second time that he completely reinvented himself. Because at Antioch, he met Douglas McGregor. Douglas McGregor was the president of Antioch when Warren was in his sophomore year. And at Antioch, as Warren says, if the army had taught him discipline, Antioch taught him to have his own opinions. And he started to write his opinions. He, at that time, took on a pseudonym and started to write satire in the college magazine. And the name that he adopted was Dr. Gruppen Oskenfundner, Okay, which, um, for those of you who don't know German, translates into Dr. Group Finder Router. Okay, uh, so, okay, and as he wrote those articles, people started to recognize his talent for writing. And when one of his colleagues looked at his, one of his term papers, they said, you know, you have potential to go to graduate school you should consider Harvard or MIT. Doug McGregor had history at MIT, wrote a recommendation for Warren, and so Warren ended up at MIT as a graduate student. Based on his writings, you would think that he did his PhD in social psychology, psychology. No, he was actually an economist, and he worked with three Nobel Prize winning economists, Paul Samuelson, Modigliani, and Robert Solow. With his typical modesty, Warren claims that they were all very relieved when he went into organizational studies. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so he went into organizational studies and, okay, oops. Ah, there should have been, let me see. Ah. And in 1961, he wrote his first book, The Planning of Change. He also wrote an HBR article called Revisionist Theory of Leadership. In The Planning of Change, he coined the word change agent, phrase change agent. Right? And that was 47 years ago. With some of the articles that he wrote at that time, including Democracy is Inevitable, um, and the temporary society, Warren started to become known as a futurist. So in fact, Alvin Toffler later in Future Shock drew heavily on Warren's work in the temporary society. Because Warren always had this tremendous sense for what will happen and being in close touch with trends as they were coming up. So this was a remarkably productive period for him at MIT, but in true Warren fashion, it wasn't enough. So he went to Bethel with the T groups 
and became one of the leaders and pioneers in organizational development and T-group training. Went to Boston University, taught at Harvard, came back to MIT, and then took this trip that had a great impact on me personally because he went to India. That is Warren Bennis with his daughter wearing what is called a lungi. It's a South Indian uh, cloth that people wrap around their waist with his driver and his uh, uh, you, you know, assistant. He was one of the founding people of an institute called the Indian Institute of Management in Calcutta, where I went to study several years later, just before I came to Harvard as a graduate student. Um, and he was the founder and really sort of the intellectual father of that institute. Okay. So he, he spent a, a couple of years in India doing that, and then again, you know, having accomplished the challenge of building a new institute, he returned to MIT. And he decided that he would try and practice what he was teaching. So he went to SUNY Buffalo as the provost and was the provost there during the period of the student unrest. And you can see him, 1967 to 71, confronting, uh, talking with the students. And he was very influential with the university president in listening to the students and hearing their concerns at that time when you know, there was unrest throughout the US. And from there, he went to the University of Cincinnati. Now here, as you can see, though he worked so hard, he always got fully engaged in what he did. Uh, so that is Warren Bennis with the symbols with the band at the University of Cincinnati. Okay. Um, and that is Warren Bennis again, okay, in a race car outfit. But this is Warren at the University of Cincinnati. And this was a pivotal point. Because as Warren said, while he worked 14-hour days and 18-hour days at Cincinnati, he still found time to write. And what he wrote was, I realized I had become the victim of a vast, amorphous, unwitting conspiracy to prevent me from doing anything whatsoever to change the status quo. Unfortunately, I was one of the chief conspirators. And he said, I developed my first law of academic pseudodynamics. Routine work drives out non-routine work and smothers to death all creative planning, all fundamental change in the university or any institution for that matter. But during that time, he also formed some of the opinions that shaped his thinking on leadership. Because what he said was, I wanted to be the kind of university president who led, not managed. Many an institution is well managed and yet very poorly led. The perceptions of other people can be a prison. People impute motives to their leaders, love or hate them, seek them out or avoid them, and idolize or demonize them, independently of what the leaders do or are. Ironically, at the very time I had the most power, I felt the greatest sense of powerlessness. It was shortly after this, at the age of 53, that Warren had a heart attack. But this being Warren, he didn't just do it the way other people do it. He had his heart attack at Windsor Castle in the UK, so, so the Queen's physicians could look after him. And, and he ended up at Middlesex Hospital, the same hospital where Rudyard Kipling and other people had been treated. Okay. And he finally, at that time, by the grace of God, someone from USC, Jim O'Toole, called him while he was in London recuperating and asked him if he would come to USC. And in a weak moment, he agreed. Um, and okay. at USC, shortly after coming here, was when he wrote his first book called Leaders. And in that, he wrote, learning is the essential fuel of the leader, the source of high-octane energy, 
that keeps up the momentum by continually sparking new understanding, new ideas, new challenges. Then he wrote on becoming a leader. No, no one sets out to be a leader. People set out to live their lives, expressing themselves fully, become the person you started out to be and enjoy the process of becoming. And in an invented life, anyone in authority, astronaut or baseball player, university president or national leader, is to some extent the hostage of how others perceive him or her. Okay. Um, no, let me go back. And uh, here he is with President Stephen Sample and Howard Schultz of Starbucks. Howard Schultz said, just the right blend of management wisdom and leadership action. At USC, Warren does a lot of things. He continues, of course, to hobnob with presidents, Reagan and Colin Powell. Okay. But there are two last quotes that I want to read because they epitomize much of what Warren is. Okay. He says, I believe in self-invention. To be authentic is literally to be your own author to discover your native energies and desires, and then to find your own way of acting on them. When you've done that, you are not existing simply to live up to an image posited by the culture, family tradition, or some other authority. When you write your own life, you have played the game that was natural for you to play. You have kept covenant with your own promise. And finally, he says, at USC, I have the leisure to consolidate what I've learned about self-invention, about the importance of organization, about the nature of change, about the nature of leadership, and to find ways to communicate those lessons. I think I have entered Erickson's seventh stage, the generative one, in which self-absorption gives way to altruistic surrender to the next generation. Although writing is my greatest joy, I also take enormous pleasure in people growing, in watching others bloom, in mentoring as I was mentored. And as someone you know, who has been the beneficiary of this mentorship, um, you know, I am tremendously grateful that Warren has come to USC, that Warren is a friend, that he is a mentor, and I hope his greatest contributions are yet to come. So, and, Pleased to honor Warren Benz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did you do that for my kids? Sorry? Did you do that for my kids? Thank you all. Thank you, Arvin, for sharing Warren's story. It's wonderful to see all of you here, and especially because this is the 10th year anniversary of the International Leadership Association. We're 10 years young. And for our colleagues, who you're all very special to me from USC, um, this association started 10 years ago um, at the University of Southern California by the group who Jean had talked about earlier from Barbara Kellerman and Georgia Sorensen and James Regregor Burns who really started this association. And today to have with us Jim Burns and Warren who met together 10 years ago at USC along with Francis Hasselbein and Manfred Ketz de Vries, and all the many people who are here, Lorraine Matuzak and others. This is a very special occasion for us. This association is 1,700 members strong all around the world, but it is a family. And the relationships that are established between the scholars and the practitioners at this association are very powerful. And Warren has been one of those who has done that. He's a connector. He's a bridger. He really brings people together. And so it is our great honor today to bestow onto Warren Bennis on this November 14th, 2008, the ILA Leadership Lifetime Achievement Award and to induct him into the ILA Leadership Legacy Program. 
The ILA Achievement Award is in gratitude for all of Warren's tremendous work in advancing the field of leadership. Much of the work that he has done in his research, in his many articles, his many books, his many books, his many books <laughs> that he has written, in recognition for what you have done to advance the field of leadership, the ILA presents to you a pewter plat, plate that represents the International Leadership Association's gratitude. And if, there we go, could come forward. And then second, and more importantly, for all that Warren has given through his teachings and his conversations and the building of relationships, that's the important part. And so we have also bestowed to you a number of individuals who have written notes for you to keep with you for the time and to read, um, to remember all of the relationships and the connections who you have made for many, many years. And you know that for me personally, you have been one of those who you've touched me deeply. Um, and so for a recognition for your legacy, we present to you this plate and these testimonials. Your legacy will be shared with many others for many, many years. You will also be in the ILA Leadership Legacy Wall of Fame. We will proudly display your portrait at the James McGregor Mearns Academy of Leadership. And in addition, in the ILA Virtual Wall of Fame, which will include a website dedicated to our Lifetime Achievement Award recipients. So on this 14th day of November, 2008, as a president of the International Leadership Association and as a dear friend, I formally induct you into the ILA Leadership Legacy Program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Hey. Thank, thank you very much. Have you heard? Thank you, please. Um, Arvin has left to go back to class. <laughs> and I wanted to thank him so much for that uh, kind of surprising introduction <laughs> of, of me throughout certain stages. Um, Gene tells me I was attractive when I was a kid in the Bronx, too. <laughs> I'm going to need this plate to uh, put part of my ego, which is irresistibly enlarged today. Uh, I wrote a note to you because before I thought I would be able to come, uh, and it's in the beginning of the first, don't bother looking at it because I'd like to read it to you. It says, Dear ILA colleagues, in the first academic speech I ever gave, I think it was 1956, I think it was before the, the American Sociological Association, uh, the president of the association came over to thank me for my talk. I nervously asked him what he thought. He said something like, content, C plus, brevity, A minus. <laughs> I should get an A plus today for brevity, since I'm not going to utter a word, which I'm now in person saying this. Uh, but I hope my content get, got better during these years. Uh, for that, I've enclosed a new chapter and epilogue for the 20th anniversary edition of, of Unbecoming a Leader. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you have a chance to read it on your way home. I'm also very honored uh, to be a quartet of people being honored uh, here by the ILA. I wish I could see all of your eyes. I wish I had this kind of peripheral vision where I could see all of you, because I see so many friends and old acquaintances and close colleagues. And um, it's, it's, very, it's very touching. And I just want to say about my my the other three who were honored by ILA, I think the, the, I think the honors bestowed by an organization, uh, this is a double or triple or quartet conceit, 
is it really determines the quality of that organization. When I think of Manfred, and, and, and I think of Francis, and I think of Jim Burns, I think in every case we've seen people, writers, thinkers, who've always been transformational. And by that I mean they always get you in the brain, which moves you to your stomach, and back to your brain, and then into positive social action. And I'm so pleased, honored, to be part of that quartet. Um, I'm deeply touched today um, in a way that I've never been before, really, in, a, in this public setting, being honored. The problem with being honored and the challenge of being honored um, is that it makes you realize the standards you have to live up to. That is a challenge. I want to say also a special thanks to my buddy here on the right, whose husband died just this year, too prematurely to have ever been given this honor to Harold J. Levitt, uh, a man actually who, who introduced me to my field years and years ago. And he was, in my view, always the star that I wish mine could shine as brightly and I wish he were here with us today, too. And I want to thank Cynthia and the ILA and Shelley and all the others of you who have, the, the backstage people who made all of this so possible. So thank you so very much. I'm so pleased to be honored by you and to be here with you today. Thank you all. <laughs>